So, uh, as I say, good morning. The cleverest of all of us, so said Dorothy L. Sayers, and she knew a thing or two about protective vision. The master of the final twist, said Agatha Christie, and she knew a thing or two as well. That's why I was genuinely delighted to be given this opportunity to talk about Anthony Buckley Cox, um, one of my favourite writers. I'm going to tell you a little bit about his life and his work. I can work out how to do this. <laughs> and hopefully I'll be able to give you some idea of why he is one of the most uh, important figures, in some ways the most important figure, of the golden age of detective fiction. Anthony Barclay Cox, or Anthony Barclay, as he's best known, was born on the 5th of July, 1893, in Watford, a small English provincial town near London. <laughs> his father, Alfred, was a doctor, and his mother, Sybil, was a descendant of the Earl of Monmouth, a courtier to Queen Elizabeth I, and somewhat at the other end of the social scale, he was also descended through his mother from a notorious smuggler, Francis Isles. Um, remember the name. The family home was the rather oddly named Monmouth House and the Platts. Um, remember that name too. Tony Cox was educated in the usual English way, attending a local school, Rose Hill, and in 1907, at the age of 14, he won a scholarship to an ancient public school, not Eton or Harrow, but Sherborne in Dorset. Other famous Shibonians include the computing pioneer Alan Turing and, many years after Cox, the poet Cecil Day-Lewis, better known, of course, to readers of detective fiction as Nicholas Blake. Tony Cox was what we would now call a high achiever at school, head of his house, school prefect, colour sergeant in the officer training corps, and an expert marksman. At the age of 19, he went up to Oxford to read classics, joining University College in the Michaelmas term 1912. And the uh, has stopped working. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, that's University College Oxford. Um, in Hillary term 1914, he sat his first public exams and he got a third. And he went off to fight in the war, and like the great majority of his contemporaries, he never returned to complete his degree. Cox served in the 7th Northamptonshire Regiment. Oh, goodness me, this is fun. There we are. Uh, reaching the rank of uh, lieutenant, and he also served in the Royal Air Force. I should make clear that this is a contemporary picture of the regiment, and while I like to think Tony Cox is in it, I can't guarantee that he is. <laughs> um, after the war, uh, Tony Cox spent a couple of years trying to find out what nature intended him to do in life, before he discovered that he had the most extraordinary knack for writing comic stories for the many uh, magazines and newspapers that, this is good fun, <laughs> many newspapers, I wish I hadn't got so many clicks, <laughs> the many newspapers and magazines that carried such fiction in the 1920s. He wrote for all of these magazines and, and several more. He also wrote a couple of comic novels and he composed music and an opera. Now, thankfully, he also decided to try his hand at something more serious, a detective mystery. His second published novel, I'll, I'll come to the first later, was The Winchingham Mystery, first published under his own name in 1926 in the Daily Mirror, a British newspaper. In the story, a young woman named Stella Vernon disappears during a seance conducted in a priest's hole. And when the penultimate episode disappeared, the newspaper posed its readers three questions. How did Stella disappear? Who caused her disappearance? And why? The competition attracted thousands of entries from around the world, but quoting the newspaper, no competitor completely solved the wintering of mystery, and the editor divided the first and second prizes among five competitors of equal merit. The newspaper also announced that 25 consolation prizes of five pounds were awarded to the senders of the next best attempts. And when I first saw this list, I was rather pleased to notice that one of the sums up lived in Wimbledon, where I live. Then I was rather more pleased to notice that one of the ones was somewhere else. Now some of you will be ahead of me here. I knew who Colonel Stiles was. And I knew that the Colonel's wife had herself written some detective stories. And it doesn't seem too fanciful to suppose that she, rather than her husband, had attempted to solve the puzzle of the vanishing debutante, and that she had entered the competition under her husband's name. The name of the Colonel's wife, well, of course, <laughs> 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 
It's worth noting that the word ruse of entering a competition under somebody else's name would play a vital part in one of her most sinister mysteries published only a few years later, a novel that also includes a seance. And of course, one of Agatha Christie's most famous Poirot novels may have taken its inspiration directly from Anthony Barclay Cox. If I could get this thing, there we go. <laughs> So Tony Cox was delighted by the success of Winter and Mystery, which would go on to be published in book form as Sicily Disappears, and credited not to Anthony Buckley Cox, but to A. Monmouth Platts. A. Monmouth Platts? That sounds familiar. <laughs> and the pseudonym is, of course, named for his childhood home. A second early effort was Mr. Priestley's Problem, expanded from a short story and aptly subtitled Extravaganza in Crime. The novel features a memorable passage in which the hero and heroine are handcuffed together. A scene that some will recall from Alfred Hitchcock's 1935 film, John Button's thriller, The 39 Steps. I believe the scene was lifted quite directly from Cox's novel. And while Tony Cox continued to write comic pieces, he decided to major on writing detective fiction. Bluntly, the returns were better. As he wrote it around this time, the criminal doesn't matter in the least. He rarely appears before the last paragraph or two. What Cox needed was a detective, which is where Roger Sheringham comes in. Tony Cox's first novel, length detective uh, story, had been published in 1925. This was the Wintry, uh, sorry, the uh, Leighton Court mystery, a country house murder, and as you can see on the front cover, in place of the author's name, there is a question mark. In the book, there is a detective, Roger Sheringham, a man with more than a hint of his creator about him, like Cox, an Oxford man, educated in the usual English way, and invalided out of the First World War. In the book, there's a closed circle of suspects, and there is a suitably unpleasant victim who is found dead in a locked room. While the mechanical explanation of the crime is a little disappointing, the murderer's identity is certainly not. Tony dedicated the novel to his father, who had inspired in his son a love of detective stories. And in the dedication, Cox explained that he tried to make the gentleman, who eventually solves the mystery, behave as nearly as possible as he might be expected to do in real life. That is to say, he is very far removed from a sphinx, and he does make a mistake or two occasionally. <coughs> that fallibility, a tendency to make a mistake or two occasionally, may very well have been inspired by E.C. Bentley's famous novel, Trent's Last Case, published a dozen years earlier. Certainly, fallibility was to become something of a trademark for Roger Sheringham. The Lincoln Court mystery sold well, and enthused by the sales figures, Tony Cox decided to make Roger Sheringham the central figure of a series of mysteries. But the writer was very uncomfortable with the constraints of what he called the usual crime puzzle of fiction. So he also decided that he would challenge some of the generally accepted tropes of the detective story. Why should the amateur sleuth always be right? Why shouldn't the police be right sometimes? Why shouldn't the butler do it? <laughs> Why shouldn't the murderer be the last person known to have seen the victim? <laughs> Why shouldn't the murderer go free? Why shouldn't the wrong man sometimes be arrested and convicted and executed? Tony Cox's second mystery, again originally published without the author's name, was, you know what I'm trying to do here, uh, it's going, it's gone. The Witchford Poisoning Case. Um, now this novel was based on a real-life murder, uh, that of James Maybrick by his wife Florence. And like many other writers of the Golden Age, Cox had a deep interest in what we now call true, true crime, writing essays on various different cases over the years. And this would not be the only occasion on which he would draw on what he called the far more absorbing criminological dramas of real life. While Tony Cox would come to consider the Witchford Poison case among his worst, fit only for incineration, it, uh, the novel is notable for the innovative consideration of psychology, both of the victim and of the murderer, and this was an approach that Cox would eventually perfect. Roger Sheridan would also appear in Cox's next novel, Roger Sheringham in The Vain Mystery. I should say at this point, if anyone has a, a, a nice reproduction of the original cover of The Vain Mystery, could they upload it, please? Because <laughs> uh, I couldn't find one. <laughs> um, and like the rest of this detective fiction from now on, Roger Sheringham in The Vain Mystery would be published as by Anthony Barclay. I always think these old covers are actually beautiful. Mm -hmm. Here we go. 
In all, Sherry McKeers in ten novel-length detective stories, one of which, incidentally, is dedicated to none other than A.B. Cox. <laughs> and Roger Sherry is also mentioned in passing in two other novels, The Piccadilly Murder and Trial and Error. Although undoubtedly, Sherry is one of the great detectives of the Golden Age, he's not particularly original. As I've mentioned already, there is much of Philip Trent about him, but despite conforming broadly to the most obvious conventions of the detective story, there is always a crime, and there is at least always one, there is always at least one detective, each of the Sheringham mysteries brings something new and fresh to what Cox had previously dismissed as the crime puzzle. They have what can be described as twist endings, but that is to diminish their ingenuity and Cox's importance in the history of crime and detective fiction. While other luminaries wrought their magic consistently, Agatha Christie in making the most likely suspect the least likely suspect, and John Dixon Carr in making the impossible possible, Tony Cox delighted on finding different ways to structure the crime story, focusing not so much on having a twist at the end, but on twisting the detective story itself. As an example, Roger Sheridan and the Vane mystery is not solved by the omniscient amateur sleuth, but by a policeman. Chief Inspector Moresby would appear in seven novels and several short stories. The standout among the novels from this period is The Poisoned Chocolates Case. Oh, we've gone too far, have we? No. Let's go. So let's see what's happened here. There we go. Um, uh, which, uh, obviously, Martin mentioned earlier on. Um, the, the Poisoned Chocolates Case. Where am I? I've lost my place here. Sorry. Like Mr. Priestley's problem, this novel is expanded from a short story. And like The Witch of Poisoning Case, it is based on a genuine crime. The attempt in 1922 by a disgruntled horticulturist to murder the then Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police Service, uh, Brigadier General Sir William Horwood, by sending him a package of walnut whips, either <laughs> arsenic or strychnine. Um, the poisoning with which Cox's novel is concerned is investigated not only by the police, but by Sheringham and other members of the Crimes Circle, a private dining club of criminologists. Each member of the circle advances a plausible solution to the mystery, but one by one the solutions fall, including, to the sweetest surprise, the solution proposed by Roger Sheringham. Eventually the mystery is solved by Ambrose Chitterwick, an unassuming and aspergic amateur sleuth, that's very difficult to say by the way, <laughs> whose hobbies include philately and horticulture, tweaking the nose of anyone who remembered that it was a horticulturist who made the attempt to poison Sir William Morwood. As well as being a superb puzzle with multiple solutions and the opportunity to identify additional solutions, um, as uh, Martin has referred to earlier, the novel is fascinating for the links between the crime circle and the detection club, which Tony Cox had founded as a dining club in 1929, the same year that the Poison Chocolates case was published. The detection club, at least initially, comprised authors of detective stories which rely more upon genuine detective merit than upon melodramatic thrills though that definition has been significantly stretched more than once over the nearly 90 years of the club's existence. Among the club's memberships we heard earlier was G.K. Chesterton, whom Cox may well have met as a schoolboy when Chesterton visited Sherborne. Over the years, Cox would collaborate with members of the detection club on various raising ventures, such as an anthology of true crime and four round-robin mysteries, including the Floating Admiral, which we heard about earlier. The person who solves the poison chocolates case Ambrose Chitterwick, and what's the betting his middle name begins with a B, um, also appears in The Piccadilly Murder and Trial and Error, a novel that many regard as a masterpiece, second only to The Poison Chocolates Case, and, like that novel, built on a real-life case in which a murderer had to persuade the police of his guilt. Sheridan does not appear in the final two novels that were published under the name of Anthony Barclay. These are crime puzzles that, like The Winchester Mystery, first appeared as competitions in a magazine, and neither is especially memorable. A third crime puzzle was planned, but it would seem to have been abandoned because Tony Cox had found a character more exciting to write about than the sleuth. The criminal. Let me go again. Apart from a few short stories, Cox had finished with Anthony Barclay. He had a new and darker approach to the mystery, and to write them, he needed a new persona. He decided to use the name of one of his mother's ancestors, the smuggler Francis Isles. And for three years, the real identity of Francis Isles was kept a secret. With Malice of Forethought, the first novel described to Francis Isles, and I'll just beg to say here that the original 1979 TV series of Malice of Forethought is on YouTube. Very good, it is too. Um, with this book, this is the first novel described to Francis Isles, 
Tony Fox broke the mould, and at a stroke he broadened the range of crime and detective fiction. Though the novel in part derives from an early short story, and while it could be regarded as a variant of the inverted mystery because the identity of the guilty party is made clear from the opening line, Matters of Warthought is a much more complex proposition. For the first time, Cox achieved what he had spoken of doing many times before. He focused on psychology. In Malice of Forethought, he focuses on the psychology of the murderer, and in the second Isles title, Beyond Before the Fact, he focuses on the psychology of the victim. Both are what Cox described as a psychological detective story, and both are based on real life crimes. In all, three novels were published as by Francis Isles, with the third, as for the woman, less successful than it might have been had it been presented as non genre fiction under yet another name. Subtitled A Love Story, it is dedicated to Tony Cox's longtime friend, Elizabeth M. Delafield, who had written fact and fiction about the real case on which As for the Woman is based. Cox had also dedicated the witch poisoning case to Delafield, not long after her marriage, and at one time she had been suspected of being Francis Isles. While a fourth Francis Isles title was planned and even announced, Tony Cox had published his last novel. A few short stories appeared from time to time, including two recently discovered late adventures of Roger Sheridan, written as wartime propaganda, and in the 1950s he completed two volumes of extremely bad limericks, <laughs> which were published under his own name. He also wrote some radio plays for the BBC, for which he worked in its early years, and on one occasion he had plotted out a detective story with Dorothy L. Sayers live on air. The plays include one, the case of Serafino Pellizioni, the real-life crime that had inspired Cox's novel, Mr. Priestley's Problem. And this radio play is a bibliographer's delight. The script was credited to Anthony Barclay, but it included two songs by Anthony B. Cox, and it was introduced on its original broadcast by Francis Isles. <laughs> <laughs> so when A. B. Cox, A. Monmouth Platts, and Anthony Barclay were all but dead, Francis Isles lived on writing reviews for many years for a range of newspapers and magazines, including the Sunday Times, the Daily Telegraph, and the Manchester Guardian. A lesser known outlet for this late phase of Tony Cox's career was the Sherburnian, a magazine of Sherborne School, where the Francis Isles Prize for English is still awarded today. Tony Cox once said that he would write fiction until he found something that paid better. Presumably reviews did just that, allowing Cox, who had by this time become a very wealthy man through inheritance and his own efforts, to live with his second wife, Helen, alternating between a large but poorly maintained house he had bought some years earlier at Linton Hills in Devon, and the attic flat of a house in St John's Wood, London, which he owned, but other than the attic, let out to flats. After his second marriage broke down, Cox became increasingly reclusive, spending almost all of his time in Devon. Eventually his health declined, possibly a legacy of when he had been gassed in the First World War, and in 1971 he died and was buried in a family plot in Watford, not far from where he was born. Astonishingly, it is over 75 years since Tony Cox's last novel was published, and yet his legacy lives on. The Detection Club is flourishing, as you may hear from its president, who is one of the speakers today. The novel of psychological suspense is flourishing too, with two of the three Francis Isles novels standing up extremely well to modern masters like Barbara Vine. And the detective story is flourishing too, which I think Cox would find rather surprising. A plain speaking critic, he would doubtless raise more than an eyebrow at some of the titles that have been reprinted in recent years, but even if he wouldn't admit as much, he would take immense pride in the fact that a genre he did so much to nurture and challenge has survived, with some genuine classics still finding new audiences 70 to 90 years after they were first published, thanks to the British Library and HarperCollins. And among those classics must be included some of Cox's own novels, Poison Chocolate's Case and Trial and Error certainly, but arguably Jumping Jenny and Murder in the Basement also have a place. What do we know about Anthony Barclay Cox himself? For example, how far can we assign to Cox the misogyny and anti-Semitism displayed in his novels? Did Cox, like Sheridan, have the profoundest contempt for his reading public? It's of course impossible to know. What is clear from the records and reminiscences of his contemporaries is that, as Martin said earlier, Tony Cox had a very particular sense of humour. He dedicated a book to himself. He named the murderer in two of his early novels after boys he'd been at school with. <laughs> Possibly. He dedicated the first Francis Alton Isles novel, in which a man plots to murder his wife, to his first wife. <laughs> and he dedicated the second Francis Isles novel, in which a man plots to murder his wife, to his second wife, <laughs> who had formerly been married to his literary agent. 
Like Roger Sherry, Tony Cox could be abrasive and rude. Like Roger Sherry, who Cox said was based on an offensive person I once knew, Cox seems to have been a good deal too pleased with himself. Never afraid of taking great decisions, and often quite illegal ones, but he thinks that pure justice could be served better in this way than by 12 possibly stupid jurymen. <laughs> quoting a biography Cox wrote of uh, Sherry. And one is instantly reminded of the time that Cox defended himself unsuccessfully on a charge of speeding by claiming that he was driving more safely than he would have been had he obeyed the speed limit. <laughs> but whatever his shortcomings as a man, it's certain that Tony Cox did much to shape the evolution of the detective story in the 20th century and to transform it from the crime puzzle into the novel of psychological suspense. In the words of John Nixon Carr, he downed tools too soon, and more than most, Anthony Barclay Cox deserves to become immortal. Thank you. I think that um, they were very fond of each other. Um, I wouldn't go any further than that. I think it's just speculation. They certainly exchanged a lot of letters over the years, but I don't see uh, anything more than that, I'm afraid. I know others do. And they, they may mention that themselves. <laughs> I just thought the next time I read Diary of Mitchell, maybe I might look at it with different eyes. <laughs> okay. Is there a question up the back there? Or was that scratching? <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. 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 No? Okay, thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.